Thank you. Thank you, Baran uh, Khan, uh, for your very kind words and also for uh, co-directing uh, this event. Uh, and also special, very, very special thanks goes to uh, the, uh, Professor Nejmettin Pamir, a uh, long-term, uh, long-time uh, mentor uh, and a very important figure in not only in Turkey, Europe and all over the world. And, and all, I'll thank you all participants being here today, uh, Saturday, you know, you, you can spend time with your family, but this is something we love. Uh, this is the love of neurosurgery and wherever neurosurgery comes, we are there. So thank you for being all here and I'll start my talk. And I also, I'd like to thank the, uh, uh, the other distinguished uh, speakers today, uh, Nejmettin and Hussein. Uh, and uh, I am from, originally from Turkey. I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and currently I practice here. Uh, I have no disclosures. And this is our lovely city, Madison, as uh, built in the isthmus of the three lakes. And we welcome all of you guys here uh, whenever this pandemic o gets over. And, uh, and of course, I mean, this is the meeting for uh, Roton's Turkish uh, fellows uh, under the auspices of uh, Ajibadem University. But, you know, this is the best picture of Dr. Roton. I, I, I love him uh, and so approachable. Uh, and anytime you ask something, he wouldn't, he wouldn't dismiss you. He will, he will answer his best. He will do his best to answer your question. And it's truly very nice human quality. Uh, so enjoyed uh, when he's teaching, you can see the joy uh, he was having. And, and that's, that's a very important feeling uh, for, the, uh, for the, his followers. So again, uh, 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 we are very, very, very grateful uh, to him. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he's, he's watching now from somewhere. So uh, I'll start with the just, just my concept of posterior transpetrosal approaches. I think anterior transpetrosal approaches is covered in a separate uh, talk. So. These are the approaches going through the mastoid bone or petros part of the temple bone for lesions involving the mostly petroclival region. And it's difficult to, uh, you know, this lesion, these lesions are usually difficult to access via uh, uh, conventional neurosurgical approaches like retrosigmoid approach, which is the workhorse of the uh, neurosurgery. Uh, there are three main types of the posterior transpetrosal approaches, uh, 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 retrolabyrinthine, translabyrinthine, and transcochlear approaches. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it is, uh, you know, there are also so many modifications and different combinations of these, and you can perform these as a pure retrolabyrinthine, translabyrinthine, or transcochlear approach, or you can combine with the others. But the whole idea is accessing the ventral part of the brainstem without significant retraction or traction on the cranial nerves and the, and the brain. And uh, retrolabyrinthine itself uh, is it's approach to design to preserve the hearing but it is very limited approach and, and limited presigmoid posterior fossa approach, also limited the middle fossa, and you have to transect the superfetus of sinus. And we like to perform this when patient has a intact hearing or serviceable hearing. Translabyrinthine approach is we are going one step further, a more anterior ventral approach, and then you are drilling the Sim, you are removing the semicircular canals and the vestibule. So you are sacrificing the hearing if hearing is present, but usually we like to do this approach when the case is, there's no serviceable hearing or hearing is so borderline 
you know that you are going to lose the hearing anyway. Uh, transcochlear approach, another step forward, we are going more ventral again. And this time, the function you are, I wouldn't say sacrifice, but function you are risking is the function of the facial nerve because you are drilling more and you have to transpose the facial nerve. ENT colleagues call this a long transposition. And then, then when you transpose the facial nerve, you are taking the periosteum and that kind of devascularized the nerve in a, in a sense. And then patients wake up with a significant facial weakness. It may improve, but it's not going to improve more than the better than the uh, house and break in grade three. So anytime you do something, you are taking a, some kind of function or you are risking the function. And there are combined approach. You can combine these approaches with the anterior transpectoral approaches or middle fossa subtemporal approaches. And there are so many of them. The main thing is getting ventral, ventral to the seven and eight complex, ventral to the fifth nerve. And if you drill more, you're gonna get more, but you are also risking the losing the function in, in some of these uh, 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 approaches. So how I select my approach, I select my approach according to clival level. So for example, lesions located in the first one fourth of the uh, upper one fourth of the uh, clivus from dorsum cellular to petrous ridge. You don't need to do these approaches, of course. And for the second one to fourth, petrous ridge from the IAC and maybe transpetrosal approaches or supratentorial approaches better than the posterior transpetrosal approaches. But if you come to this third one fourth and the lower, you won't be able to come through those conventional approaches or, or anterior transpetrosal approaches. So you need to combine this with the posterior transpetrosal approaches. And again, uh, there are so many uh, uh, variations and uh, modifications of these approaches. So we are, my topic today is the focusing is the, this area, this area, and, and I'm gonna, and convince you guys to why transpetrosal approaches are important, but also selecting the proper approach is depends on the anatomy and the pathological anatomy. Anatomy disturbed by the pathology. So if you understand these con concepts, you don't go with the one approach and every patient you, you may select, uh, end up selecting a different approach. So, Briefly going over, I know Nejmetin and the Hussein will go over these uh, more anatomical details and in more in a more detailed fashion. So I'm going to be more focusing on the case illustrations. But this is the approach you. It's very limited approach. You transect, divide the uh, uh, superior petrosal sinus, and you are pre-sigmoid. But limiting factor is the semicircular canals. And without drilling that, and there are other modifications. We know that transcrucial, I'm not going to go into those. But this is a very limited approach. And pure retro labyrinthine approach alone, without combining with the middle fossa, is a kind of very narrow corridor and only good for the uh, tumors in, like endo, endolymphatic sac tumors or very selected epidermoid tumors or something like that. So. I am not fan of the uh, pure retro labyrinthine approach. Translab approach, on contrary, it, it, it you go more ventral. Now you drill entire semicircular canal. It seems small when you compare to uh, 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 the retro labyrinthine approach, but it actually gives you a direct access to the internal acoustic canal and more ventral exposure of the brainstem. Again, we are going one step ahead and we are now on the transcochlear approach. This will expose more anterior and you are getting to the base of the lesion, uh, which is the petroclival dura. And in many of these lesions you are attacking, we are using this approach. But again, you are transposing the facial nerve and that increases the risk of facial nerve injury. Position. 
in most of the cases, I'll prefer spine position with the shoulder roll or without shoulder roll, depending on the patient's body habitus and the neck, shortness of the neck or long neck or other factors. If spine is not good, you can do lateral park bench or you can, if, if you're comfortable, you can do even a sitting position. Skin incision is depends on, uh, again, the, it depends on the, you are combining or you are doing pure approaches. Combining with the middle fossa, you need to extend more. If you are doing more extensive approach, you need to do bigger. So you tailor your incision according to the patient and the lesion. And the muscle dissection, you, like, you better get the good facial uh, uh, exposure and then you can use the fascia for reconstruction purposes. And then you get these and then you guys know these anatomical landmarks much better than I do. So uh, you need to learn these so that will help you to topographically help you to localize the structures in the mastoid bone in the petrous bone. And Asterion is not a constant landmark. Uh, this is another topic of a discussion. And the retrolab approach, again, you are doing the very nice mastoidectomy, exposing the middle fossa. If it is pure retrolab, more if it is combined and, and respecting the semicircular canals and the hearing and the vestibule. And these anatomy I'll skip. And this is the case for just pure retrolab, limited middle fossa dura exposure, presigmoid dura, sigmoid sinus, transfer sinus, sigmoid sinus, transfer sinus junction, semicircular canals, superior, posterior, and the horizontal canal. And this is the case if you need to combine with the uh, uh, middle fossa subtemporal approach. And this is the ligation of the superior petrosal sinus and then uh, uh, sectioning of the tentorium. Translab approach, you need to drill this. And if you drill it, you lose the hearing and we prefer this like many, many times I mentioned when the hearing is not serviceable or you think that you're gonna lose the hearing and hearing is borderline and you cannot preserve the hearing. This is the case for the pure translab, small C-shaped incision and muscle dissection. And this is the, again, showing the steps of the uh, uh, translabyrinthine approach before drilling the labyrinth, after drilling the labyrinth. And this drilling this much bone gives you much wider exposure. Advantages of the translab, you identify the IAC early and direct route to the uh, CP angle, cerebellopontin angle, and almost purely epidural approach compared to the retrosigmoid approach. And you are not dealing with the cerebellum and the retracting the cerebellum, even if you don't use retraction. And you almost 270 degree, you expose the IAC. And these are our questionable, debatable uh, uh, things. Disadvantages is, is it takes little longer than the retrosigmoid approach. And the high jugular bulb might be problem in some of these cases. And if patient has a, Retracted mastoid bone uh, or active otitis media is not a good approach. We don't, it's a contraindication. And uh, it can be sometimes limited to the, the lower part of the uh, clivus. Pure translap again, combined translap. And now we are in the transcochlear. So we are transposing the, we are transposing the facial nerve completely. So like I said before, transposing the facial nerve will come with the price. Price is the losing the function of the facial nerve for a while or maybe completely. And if it improves, improves the best to the grade three. But it gives you much wider exposure and then also exposure to the petrous carotid. Transcochlear approach again, and it's more ventral. You see the, when you do these approaches, fourth nerve is extremely important, extremely important when you are sectioning the uh, 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 tentorium. Again, this shows you the demonstrating the sectioning the ten, uh, superior petrosal sinus first. You need to identify the location of the vein of labbe when you are sectioning the uh, uh, superior petrosal sinus because you don't want to you don't want to section where it is anterior or where it's posterior, and also you need to be aware of the 
you need to be aware of the drainage of the vein of labbe before surgery uh, with the radiological imaging. And cranial nerve, like I said, is extremely important. When you are cutting the tentorium, you want to localize the fourth nerve and then the cut the tentorium according to that. And another trick is not going posteriorly with your tentorial cut, going anteriorly. If you go posteriorly, it, is, it sometimes can be very misleading. You can end up going all, all the way to the torcula. Uh, so venous anatomy is important. These are beautiful dissection by uh, Dr. ML Avji. So and in, in her paper we published from here, uh, you need to know the where vein of lobe is uh, draining. Uh, it can be transverse sinus, it can be tentorial venous lakes, and very, very rarely it can drain into the superior petrous of sinus. So that will preclude the uh, 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 sectioning of the superior petrous of sinus, or you need to know where to section. So now I'm coming to the main point, uh, 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 case illustrations, where I use this posterior transpetrosal or posterior petrosal approaches and how I tailor my approaches according to the cases. So these are the few cases of the pure translab approach. Pure translab approach is perfect for tumor acoustic neuromas, vestibular schwannomas with no hearing. Uh, so uh, this is the case, a uh, very recent case, uh, a, a young female with the moderate two two centimeter uh, 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 acoustic neuroma and okay hearing. Uh, she had surgery at outside hospital, very reputable center. They do subtotal resection via retrosigmoid approach, leave the tumor here. And unfortunately she lost hearing after the surgery and normal facial function. And they continue to follow her and the tumor grows a little bit and now she start having this severe intractable trigeminal neuralgia. If you can see fifth nerve here on the left side, fifth nerve here on the right side is severely compressed by this tumor. And they recommend radiation or continuing to follow, follow up. We, we said, no, you come here, we do the translab approach. This is the approach. See, it's very limited. You don't see cerebellum at all. You, open the draw of the internal acoustic canal. Soon you're gonna see the seven and eight and opening the presigmoid dura right now and going first, opening the presigmoid dura towards the internal acoustic canal. And I remove the dura and still see, I don't see any cerebellar tissue here. Almost pure epidural approach. And now initial debulking of the tumor. And then after initial debulking, and you'll see more normal structures localizing the superior vestibular nerve. And as obvious, this is, a, I'm sectioning the superior vestibular nerve. This was an inferior vestibular nerve schwannoma. And now I continue to debulking, continuing the sharp or semi-sharp dissectors. Do not try not to use any blunt dissection around the cranial nerves if possible. You, cannot, you can cause avulsion injury or ischemic injury. So again, sharp dissection, this is the entry zone of the facial nerve in the brainstem and slowly debulking, debulking, dissecting, debulking, dissecting, and being patient in these cases. Traction, contra-traction, as you know, we know that Dr. Spessler used this technique a lot in when he removes the uh, brainstem cavernomas. Traction in the suction, and contra-traction with the dissecting hand or other way around. So now we get the facial nerve in the canal, porous, going to the cistern. And once you get the, the bulk more, you can do more. Here, I don't think facial nerve will be a problem. The main problem is the trigeminal nerve because patient has a very severe trigeminal neuralgia. Again, continuing to dissect sharp dissection or semi-sharp dissection and knowing how much traction you can apply. So once we get there, we will continue to resect and debulk, debulk. And finally, we free the tumor from the uh, uh, facial nerve. Now we are coming to do 
trigeminal nerve, as you see, trigeminal nerve is, is crashed by the tumor. You see the discoloration and why patient was having this severe trigeminal neuralgia. Once you remove these, again, traction, contra-traction, respecting the normal, not respecting the pathology, taking it out. So, and this patient can be cured with this, and this is a good example, and facial nerve shows a good stimulation. That's the trigeminal nerve, it's complete, and then, then reconstruction, and post-op day one, perfect facial function, gross total rejection, no need for radiation or any, any other things. So very likely this patient is cured. Again, uh, another example, gigantic, not gigantic, but large size, near four centimeter acoustic neuroma, 22 year old nursing home, nursing school uh, student and female, you wanna preserve the face, but same time you wanna give the best. In acoustic neuromas, I am against this hybrid surgery, debulking, subtotal resection, and then the radiation. Uh, I decide whether or not I can do gross total resection during the surgery. I don't go there with the, I'm gonna do subtotal resection, then radiate. That's not a good, good aim. Aim should be helping the patient best you can, and you decide that at surgery. Okay, we did the trans lab because her hearing was not serviceable. And we go reject this and find, go to the lower end first, and then find the lower cranial nerves. Then you decompress that. Then you start working. And, and then you see, these are the nine and 10, correlative plexus. Anterior to that, for the new beginners, you'll, you'll find the eight entry zone, then the seventh entry zone, and then, and then you have to de debulk, 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 debulk. That's the whole thing in the vestibular schwannoma surgeries. You see, going sharp dissection, and you will have, so now we identify the eighth cranial nerve, and these arteries can give feeding side feeders to the tumor. You're gonna, you have to preserve them, okay? And then, you can take it once you are sure it's going to the tumor. And now gentle traction, contra traction, and because she has no hearing, we're gonna sacrifice the eighth nerve here, uh, but those tiny capillaries and arteries you have to, and now we anterior to the eighth nerve, we find the seventh nerve. And then now it becomes much easier. I am sectioning the eighth nerve, and you go back and forth, back and forth, canal, and it, you work between canal and the brainstem and it, it keep exchanging uh, these dissection planes. When you come to the matus, is there is a always dural feeders to the tumor in this location. You have to be very careful and you use lowest intensity bipolar coagulation away from the facial nerve. And these are the, and even if you leave tiny tumor in this level, since you devascularize, tumor won't grow after surgery, okay? That helps a lot with the removing the entire draw of the internal acoustic canal in this, and that translabyrinthine approach helps you to expose entire canal. With the retrosigmoid approach, is it possible? Yes, but you drill that, and when you use the retrosigmoid approach, you use to preserve the hearing. If you drill more laterally, you may, injure the cochlea and the vestibule. Good results, grade two, grade one, and she's very likely cured now. And sometimes you can use these things. Sometimes these patients come in the middle of night, like this patient, uh, a middle-aged man with sudden headache, intractable headaches, <clears throat> and mild ventriculomegaly, and uh, I, we didn't include the uh, uh, MRI images, but there is an intratumoral hemorrhage in the cystic vestibular schwannoma. So we took him to the surgery immediately and to decompress with retrosigmoid approach. And that's a short and the direct route, but you know, it's the, in the middle of night, you don't wanna do 10 hour, 12 hour, 14 hour surgery. <clears throat> and once after the, the retrosigmoid approach, we, uh, we remove like 60% of the tumor. 
in a, in a few days, we came back and performed the definitive approach because patient didn't have any any uh, uh, intact hearing, and we performed the translabyrinthine approach. And in this case, the cystic schwannomas you see here for the beginners, sigmoid sinus, jugular bulb covered with the pedi. I'm sectioning the uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, presigmoid dura towards the internal acoustic canal. And this will, this way, this is all devascularized. And using the sharp dissection, cystic schwannomas will have, uh, uh, will be adherent to the brain and the cranial nerves more than, more than the solid schwannomas. So you need to be aware of that. Ah, sorry. Uh, and going around, dissecting, finding the normal, and moving the normal away from you. Now, once we found the a, 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 a seventh nerve, you section the eighth nerve and keep moving, keep moving. So now I section the eighth nerve. That will bring to the seventh nerve into the view, okay? This is the eighth nerve entry zone. There's always loop of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, IECA loop between two, two nerves. So you see, and some of these cases, small cases, you can even identify and preserve nervous intermediates. You see some of the fibers of the nervous intermediates here, but eventually when the large tumors, they, they disappear. So there's no way you can preserve the nervous intermediates, but moderate size and small tumors, you can preserve the nervous intermediates fibers. And now this is the feeder going directly into the tumor. We, once you identify that, you cut it and remove it. So there are different, and don't be dogmatic about your dissection techniques, spreading, sharp, peeling, uh, whatever you are comfortable, but don't evolve or apply too much traction on the nerves. Okay, that's the main thing. After a while, whatever approach you use, everything is transarachnoid or, or arachnoid approaches, okay? So this is the principle set by the our pioneers like Yashar Gil and the, and the other, other leaders. Uh, so you see the seventh nerve and I am mobilizing, this is the canal dura and it's coagulated. All the feeders coming from the dura to the tumor is gone and will eventually remove everything and the nerve stimulates nicely, sharp dissection around the nerves. And then if you go way on ventral, you can see the sixth nerve and the basilar artery easily. And I'm not dealing with the cerebellum at all. I'm not even seeing the cerebellum. So sharp dissection, these feeders, see that's tiny feeder coming to and rest of this preserved and pushed away. Push the normal anatomy away, bring the pathological anatomy to your view. And the cystic part of the tumor, we are way ventral. So this is the ventral brain stem. And eventually we'll get everything out. Gross total resection, nerves stimulate nicely. Very good result, gross total resection. House and Breckman grade one, post of day one. And he's discharged from day three but he had to stay between two surgeries, but this came emergently. So sometimes you can employ these. So don't be heroic. Oh, I, I'm going to do everything in 14 hours, one day. You don't want to start big, long surgeries. And then you want to be tired at the end of the surgery when you are the, you need it to be most fresh. You need to stay most fresh when you are dealing with the facial nerve. So another case, we employ this emergency, sudden expansion, hydrocephaly, retrosigmoid approach first, second approach. In this case, I left a tumor here on the facial nerve and because facial nerve was going crazy and I, I and she's 64 year old, you, you did your best. So this is the time you can say, hey, I did my best. I'm leaving tiny tumor, but believe or not, once you remove the tumor from the canal and the most of the tumor, these tumors don't grow. You don't have to radiate right away. You can wait and do close surveillance MRIs. And if you notice the growth, then you can do radiosurgery, but don't, don't radiate upfront. 
there are modifications of these approaches, like a fallopian bridge. Uh, you don't want to tr transpose because this lesion is small. And like this cochlear nerve schwannoma going all the way to the cochlea. So you know that you need to get better exposure than the translab. So you do fallopian bridge technique, which is the preserving the preserving the end, but you have to you have to close the external ear canal. This is the external ear canal, and we are closing that. That's why we are calling transotic. And you see the fallopian bridge here, and the tumor is here, small. But you have to be on the both side of the facial nerve to have the complete removal. And this patient is extremely dizzy. So removing vestibular neuroctomy while removing the tumor will give her a symptomatic relief. So radiation, it may take two, three years to, to get over the dizziness. So surgery is immediate, but with using this uh, transpetrosal approach and using the modification of it. You can see an immediate relief after surgery in terms of dizziness and vertigo. Combine transpetrosal approaches, and I'm going to focus on the only three modifications, retrolabyrinthine and the subtemporal middle fossa approach in first one. This is the case example, 36-year-old man, six nerve uh, uh, finding, double vision. It's not complete paralysis, but is is she he cannot cross the uh, side that much, and very large petroclival meningioma with the supratentorial extension. So you cannot just do retrolap here. There is a significant supratentorial extension. You have to combine it. Can you do? Can you do a, a, a retrosigmoid? Yes, you can, but you'll be dealing with it. So all these most bulk of the tumor in front of the anterior to the seven and eight and anterior to the fifth nerve. So you'll be retracting these nerves a lot and this tumor is heart tumor. So uh, you have to have the best exposure you can. And if possible, gross authorization. If not, just leave this part of the tumor and then the, you observe the rest. So we did, the, since his in, hearing was intact, we did the presigmoid retro labyrinthine approach, see the labyrinthine bone is uh, preserved. So I'm cutting the tentorium and after identification of the vein of la uh, gentle retraction on the temple lobe. While I'm cutting, I'm gonna isolate the uh, fourth nerve, making sure I am not cutting. And then when you cut, you cut towards anterior, okay? Don't go posterior. And now I found the seven and eight, and now the supratentorial and infratentorial compartments are all exposed and I am kind of anterior to do, but it's kind of limited, limiting approach. It's not as good as the translap or transcochlear, but patient has a good hearing, he's young. So you, you do your best to preserve the hearing. So this is the tumor and these arteries go through the tumor and you need to be very careful, especially the superior cerebellar artery and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery in petroclival meningiomas. And when you use the CUSA, be careful, don't use extreme uh, uh, intensity of the CUSA and superior aspect of the tumor, we see the cranial nerve tree. So we are very close to the all the way uh, to the uh, uh, interpedicular cisterns. So Aica loop is entering. We're going to follow that Aica loop. It's completely encased by the tumor, but we'll do our best. Our best to dissect around it, take the side feeders going to the tumor and preserve the main bulk of the main Aica, okay? So this eventually lead me to the basilar artery. And I don't know where the basilar artery is right now, but I will find it. So this is the inferior aspect of the tumor as we debulk. You see, and debulking helps and preserving the normal anatomy, most importantly. So cranial nerve six ventral to the tumor. We know that he has a six nerve palsy, but we we'll preserve the six nerve. And then go back, going back to the aica within the tumor. See, right now I am getting the glimpse of the basilar artery here, where the aica comes off from the basilar artery. Now you are winning this game, okay? Even if you cannot perform the gross totalization, 
you'll do near total resection in this. And what helped me combining these retro lab, preserving the hearing and combining with the middle fossa subtemporal approach. So now you can see the rest of the basilar. And now this also gives us the more ventral exposure than the retro sigmoid will give. And now cranial nerve tree will remove eventually everything off the cranial nerve tree, off the basilar artery, and, and the also brainstem. And there's a tiny piece left here. I'm gonna go back and clean that, and then we are done. Once that's done, you'll see, this is the view, last pieces, and I left a tiny piece, I couldn't get it right here from the Aika, and tiny piece in the posterior coronary sinus which I don't like attacking unless it's necessary. So this is pre-op images, post-op images. You will see the residual I left. And this is the residual, not showing. This is immediate post-op here, here, and here, posterior coronal sinus. So uh, again, you see the residual tumor here. And the residual I left in the brainstem is not visible. This is not, this is not this is not the residual, but hasn't been grown. It hasn't grown anything last six years, and it has been his six nerve improved. No other cranial nerve deficits. You gave him the best chance. If it grows, you can do radio surgery. Now we are going back, going to the trans lab combined with the middle fossa. Hope I'm not taking too much time. This is a 69 year old woman. They they diagnosed this two years ago. And they have been sitting on this tumor. This patient was having walking difficulty, increasing progressive headaches. And they said, you are neurologically intact. This is not growing. But patient was slowly becoming incapacitating. And just 40 or 45 percent, if I remember correctly, 40, 45 percent hearing, speech discrimination. So it is not serviceable hearing. In this case, you can use translab combined with the middle fossa approach, long incision. We're gonna do middle fossa craniotomy. We're gonna do the translabyrinthine drilling. See, this is the presigmoid dura, sigmoid sinus. This is the temporal lobe here. I am gonna identify, I am ligating the superior petrosal sinus. After identifying the vein of labbe here, entering the transverse sigmoid sinus junction. Sectioning of the tentorium anteriorly, and identifying the trochlear nerve, so making sure we are not cutting. Now we have the seven and eight nerve complex. So I'll be working. So if I came retro sigmoid here, these nerves will be in front of me. It will be between me and the tumor. So luckily tumor is soft, allows me to go work between cranial nerves, but soft tumor will, will be vascular but also this approach allows me to go to the base earlier. And then I'm going to open the internal acoustic canal. And now we are seeing the vertebral artery here and debulking, devascularizing the tumor and dissecting. Now cranial nerve seven and eight, hearing is gone, but we're going to preserve, preserve the facial nerve, but you manipulate a lot. And anytime you manipulate, you will hear the facial nerve stimulator going off. Now we have the vertebral artery. We need to be very careful with the feeding arteries or normal arteries. <coughs> this is the pica origin. So we are, see how I am manipulating because facial nerve is all the way exposed from canal to the brainstem. Facial nerve is stimulating nicely. So that gives you a good, good prognosis for facial nerve function. So now I'm going back to the canal removing the old involved dura from the canal. You see the facial at seven and eight nerve in the canal and now going superiorly and then debulking tumor and removing and vertebral artery again, vertebral artery and VB junction now we are seeing and removing, debulking the tumor with ultrasonic aspirator. See that there's a bleeding from the petrous dura I drill the petrous dura with the, uh, and the bone with the uh, uh, diamond drill. So it's hemostatic. So you see again, basilar artery, vertebral artery and their junction and mobilizing the tumor. 
it hours of dissection, but it's worth because this is the best time. First time is the best time in these cases. And removing, 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 eventually we'll, we'll get the whole thing. Cranial nerve six come to the view now, you see. And we are quite ventral now, superiorly. And we'll follow the six nerve until it enters the dorsalis canal. Small artery, again, respecting the normal. Uh, and eventually getting way ventral in the clivus, origin of the aica, and the basilar artery, and the small remnant I'm taking off the basilar artery. And then the last piece of the tumor. Seventh nerve stimulates at the 0 0.1 milliampere reconstruction with the fascia and the fat graft, abdominal fat graft. This is immediate post-op MRI, shows you to the good resection, no residual tumor, preservation of the normal anatomy. She woke up with the great four to five facial palsy and improved over months. And this is one year, is almost grade two, grade three. She said, first day, first time I feel so good. Uh, I never had a, I, I don't have a headache. I feel like I, I, my extremities moving around well. And this, they were sitting on this and calling this is a, like impossible to remove. It is not impossible, but possible, but you do your best to remove either gross totally or, or very radical subtotal resection. Another case, perfect case because no hearing at all, wheelchair bound due to the motor weakness and the progressive weakness and they send him for radiation come on i mean you radiate this he'll be completely quadriplegic uh, so we did the trans lab okay yes we left the tumor he's 68 and this is in one year he's walking normal good wisconsin farmer okay no need for radiation now this is, a, this is not a petroclival meningioma, but again, and a meningioma, very extensive meningioma involving the petrous bone and the mastoid bone. So you see, the, you have to study the venous anatomy well. Entire bone is, is diseased. Yeah, you need to do very extensive drilling here. And that's what we did. And again, I'm going to skip this because of the time. I'm already taking too much time. I apologize. And, and then this gives you from temporal lobe, okay, from temporal lobe to all the way to the internal acoustic canal. And sigmoid sinus is occluded. I'm confirming that with the needle puncture. This is the temporal dura, posterior fossa dura. And we'll, oh man, we'll drill all these and then get to the dura and extensive drilling. And we know that this is a, this is a, it's gonna be aggressive meningioma, okay? So either it's gonna be grade two or grade three, facial nerve, removing the dura of the canal with the tumor and eventually getting everything out, getting the dura, sigmoid sinus, cranial nerve, port you see there, and everything is go has to go as much as you can. Of course, you cannot change the cells, but you do your best to minimize the, uh, minimize the residual uh, uh, pathology and you this is the final view and this is the final view we when we utilize the combined posterior transpetrosal approach and and it was and she she received radiation because it was grade two and she's been doing well and these are the examples when you use the transcochlear approach transcochlear approach i will not use if patient has a normal facial function and uh, this is the dramatic drastic case of the Poor management, young man with the double vision, six nerve palsy. They go do the retro sigmoid approach. And they took like almost 10, 20% of it. And they gave the patient to cranial nerve three to cranial nerve 12 deficits, completely out. Why? They had, they retract the cerebellum. They, they probably, they were fighting with the cerebellum and tumor and then they apply traction to all those cranial nerves. And when patient woke up, patient had a paralysis of three to 12. Can you imagine? He had a peg, all that stuff. And then 
I, I had to be involved in this case and we and his facial function didn't improve six months. We waited more, it's not improving. And this is the case you can do transcochlear approach because you don't worry about facial nerve. Maybe will, it will improve, but you do, do your best to get the tumor out and a young man, you give him a functional, good functional status. And then after he improved lower cranial nerve function, we went back and we did the transcochlear approach, transpose and left this much tumor uh, because I couldn't, I couldn't get it, and I don't, I, I don't like attacking the posterior coronary sinus unless it's really necessary. And believe it or not, his facial function improved to the fore over two years. The other cranial nerve functions completely improved, and and he has been tumor stable for almost 11, 12 years now. And this is another example: illegal resident no facial function due to the gunshot wound in, in, his, in his country. And he starts having the progressive uh, uh, difficulty, walking difficulty. Again, this is the perfect case. And they were told us he cannot have MRI. Believe it or not, he had the post of MRI and nothing happened due to the gunshot wound. It's, it's a very lucky case. But we achieved near total resection. Again, I left the tumor here and he disappeared. I don't know his follow-up, but he had a uh, he's, he didn't have an additional postoperative uh, cranial nerve deficits. And sometimes we do, do enough approach, like, like this case, right? This is a young medical student, small petroclival meningioma. They continue to monitor, it's growing, and it's best time, right? You don't want to radiate this to, uh, or sit on this when it becomes bigger, then you have to do bigger approaches, more complex approaches. Or you don't want to radiate this to, turn to the acute issue in a chronic issue. So if it is growing, if, if it is not growing, you can continue to observe. If you are, if it is growing, it's time to attack, but this is an enough approach. And enough approach is retrosigmoid approach, okay? That's all you, you, you need to do. And it will give you direct root and small tumor, petroclival meningioma. You don't need this combined, combined approaches. So enough approach is enough and perfect results tumor free for so many years and another case 53 year old it supratentorial extension is not much so this is the case you can do enough approach what is enough approach is our conventional retrosigmoid approach you go remove it and it's done you don't have to do co uh, combine combine this combine long hours of surgery and another example of enough, enough, combining two enough approaches, okay? This is, I thought this is gonna be trigeminal schwannoma. We went in retrosigmoid craniotomy and planned to come back. You, so I even thought coming this way and drilling the kawase, but this goes all the way to the jugular foramen. So that's a not easy approach for anterior transpetrosal or transcavernous approach to reach that low. But I did it retrosigmoid just to make the diagnosis and, and and they remove the symptomatic part and see how it's going to be, okay? What is the pathology? If this is schwannoma, if I remove this component, I can follow this. I don't need to do anything. If it is great bone meningioma, same thing. I can follow this and I, I remove the symptomatic part. I did the surgery, retrosigmoid approach and pathology turned out to be a, pathology turned out to be a grade two atypical meningioma. So if this was a 70 year old, I will radiate. She's almost 60, 59 year old, healthy person. And if it is grade two, I need to do my best, okay? So I said, okay, we remove this part. We removed it, removed it. And I don't wanna take your time. This is a not very uh, complex case, removing everything, leaving the tumor in the Meckles cave region and decompressing everything. And pathology came back grade two atypical meningioma. Now, this, that changes the game, game plan, okay? If this was a schwannoma or grade one, I, I could follow, and this is his, uh, her MRIs immediately post-op, but if it is grade two, I need to do my best. And that is coming from the supratentorial all the way and doing the transcavernous approach after anterior clinidectomy, extradural anterior clinidectomy, and opening the membrane 
and between V2 and V3, you see the tumor here. And this is completely epidural approach at this stage and removing the tumor from the cavern, posterior cavernous sinus and removing the tumor from the Kawase, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Meckel's cave and, and working between the cranial nerves V2, V3 and, v, uh, and the lateral to the V3 between uh, GSP and, and the Petros carotid. And then soft, it's not very soft, but the nice small intensity. Now I am in the Meckel's cave because it's CSF coming, removing the last piece of the tumor and packing with the fat. This is the result. And she's currently receiving the radiation because we like to radiate the grade twos even we achieve the gross total resection. And now a case example, any approach is not enough, okay? Uh, because you ha you'll have this complex, complex cases involving the orbit, sphenoorbital, orbital, cavernous, petroclival, going all the way to the jugular tubercle, jugular foramen, and patient had six surgeries, multiple gamma knife radiations, experimental chemotherapies, his panhypopit doesn't see, and she he has completely ophthalmoplegic. And tumor is growing. Now it, the risk is the other optic nerve. And how are we gonna get this and give him the best chance? He's 48 and all you wanna do, give him a, and this is a grade two atypical meningioma, radiation induced meningioma due to the childhood histiocytosis, okay? So this, you wanna give this patient to do your best. And, and so she, he can survive a few more years with his family, okay? But while you are doing this, you have to get over this complex situation. And then that is first you do balloon test occlusion. He failed when, this, when we uh, induced the hypotension, then you have to do bypass. And I spent hours finding these nerves, uh, finding the MCA branches because it was scarred down, so many surgeries in the past. And now I'm doing the, since he failed, I have to sacrifice the IAC from neck to do bifurcation. And you don't know the posterior communicating and anterior choroidal artery. So this is the M2 I could find. And then the radial artery, proximal, uh, first distal bypass, and then toe and heel sutures. I don't want to spend time. And then this is the common carotid artery because she, he has a high bifurcation. We are using the aortic punch to make a hole in the uh, common carotid artery due to the high bifurcation. I couldn't do the external carotid bypass. This is the radial artery. It's quite short, but we are, my assistant is bringing it in and doing this bypass. Once this bypass is done, it's working. This took 10 hours because of the old dissections. I am ligating the ICA in the neck and I'm gonna come back in two, two or few days to do the definitive approach, which is the transcavernous approach. Now I spent hours, hours, hours to find normal IAC, normal M1. And this is the Probably they had the bleeding from the carotid. They put the gauze and the glue, you see this region. And I couldn't find the choroidal or PCOM. So I eventually I exposed the ICA bifurcation. I put the temporary clip. It's already in the neck, it's closed. Uh, so no changes in MEPs, SSCPs for 40 minutes. So then I took entire I, internal carotid artery, cavernous carotid artery. I did the orbital cavernous exenteration and remove the part of the tumor, most of the tumor from posterior fossa. When I couldn't reach to do uh, a jugular tubercle, I stopped, I came back as a retrosigmoid approach. Did I remove gross totally? No, but near totally. So this is the fat graph we put. I left the tumor on the brainstem was quite stuck to do AICA and I left tumor in the hypo, hypo, hypothalamus region and it, which was quite stuck to do perforators. And the bypass is patent. He woke up fine, he remains fine and I gave him the best chance. I don't know when he's gonna have the recurrence but at least I gave him the best chance, okay? So you need to 
every case is different. You, get, you don't do one approach all the time, okay? You need to be versatile. So uh, why? So first, patient's neurological findings, most important thing, okay? You tailor your, your approach according to the neurological findings and according to the normal anatomy and the pathological anatomy. Hearing status plays very important role in choosing the uh, transpetrosal approaches and modifying them. Small to moderate size meningiomas without significant supratentorial extension, you can deal with them with the conventional retrosigmoid approach. In large tumors with significant uh, supratentorial extension, but good hearing, you, need, you can do retrolab. In large tumors, no hearing, translab. In large tumors, rarely you will have patients with the facial weakness, you can do transcochlear. Staging, I like, I like staging some of these tumors. Even if I do combined pet aprosol approaches, I do do approach one day, remove some tumor, came back as a second stage because these surgeries take so long and you don't want to be tired. You don't want to have a tired personnel in the operating room and the patients get tired too, even the under general anesthesia. So give them a few days, let them recover from the anesthesia and then come back when you are fresh. Summary, thorough knowledge of the temple bone anatomy, go to the lab, okay? Without lab practice, you cannot perform these surgeries, you cannot perform bypasses, you cannot do any. So use your time to go to the lab and that's the Roton's legacy, right? Yashargi's legacy, all these pioneers legacy, going to the lab, spending time. Believe it or not, these are the pictures from 1953 or 1957. Uh, Dr. Ture gave me this, and look at these 3D images. Yashargil did this, 3D in 50s. Can you imagine? Because he had a vision. He said that if I go to lab, I can become a good microneurosurgeon. And I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. I show this slide many, many times. So without lab practice, lab training, you cannot do these, okay? Even if you have a one small corner, use that okay and if you don't have it go to other places if you are in turkey go to Ajibadem, go to yedi tepe go to ege university go to jarrah pasha university ankara university there are labs mersin university there are labs china there are so many good labs in everywhere if you cannot come to us go to other places okay we are we are well we welcome everybody and I know that next society meeting will be in Istanbul. I like to see all of you guys, all of the Rotom fellows, all of the micro neurosurgeons, people who love micro neurosurgery in Istanbul. Hopefully this pandemic gets over and we can see you in the, this beautiful city. To me is the most beautiful city in the world, but you know, I'm Turkish, so that's easy to say. And microsurgery resurgence. We are not gonna let microsurgery die, okay? We are not gonna, our mentors kept them alive. Dr. Pamir in Turkey and professor, it started everything with the professor Yashargil, Roberto Hiros, Robert Spessler. They kept this alive. We need to, we need to carry on their legacies, okay? Uh, I, and you guys invited here many good uh, speakers, Dr. Liu, uh, Jim and Aaron, uh, Dr. Spessler. We need to, and you guys, young guys, need to get this flag from us, carry this flag, okay? So we are not, microsurgery is not gonna die. We are not gonna let that happen. Okay, I, I got fired, so, so I got excited. Thank you very much, I'll stop here, and I'm happy to take uh, any answers, and I apologize for, uh, I apologize for taking too much time. Uh, thank you for this uh, magnificent presentation, as usual, sir. Um, Dr. Pamir, uh, is there any contribution, sir, uh, from your side? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. This is a really wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know very well that uh, Presigmoid approach is one of my favorites. Uh, but um, I saw your uh, on your slides also. Is there a need uh, to do 
so much bony uh, removal. I mean, uh, making craniotomy uh, for subtemporal and posterior fossa. Uh, because uh, I, I realized that um, sigmoid sinus uh, limits our posterior retraction and lappe limits our superior retraction of the uh, temporal lobe. Uh, whatever we remove the bone, I mean, make the craniotomy, this is our limitations. And uh, for many years, I do go directly to that triangle, uh, expose the um, uh, sigmoid sinus, uh, and a little bit uh, uh, temporal dura. Uh, and I, I opened the posterior fossa first and cut the uh, um, uh, tentorium uh, and ligate the superior petrosal sinus. Um, what, what do you think about this? I, I think, uh, uh, Professor Pomer, you are right. So if, if you don't need to, you don't need to drill all these. And that's why I would like, I want to show you, all of you, uh, there are certain cases, unfortunately, when they reach the huge sizes is, and if the hearing status is, hearing status allows you to do, do the widest exposure possible. But in certain case, retro lab, in certain case, retro sigmoid works very well. And then when you get more experience, you tend to do less bony exposure. No question. Uh, it, it, during the young, you know, early years, you always worry about the retraction and other things. And then you want to do, you want to do OZ, for example, or very wide uh, exposures. But as you get experience and you do less and less, I, know, I haven't done any OZ last 10 years. And if I can, I would like to go retro sigmoid or retro lab. If I cannot, if I, if no hearing, trans lab definitely gives you much better exposure in the internal acoustic canal. So I wholeheartedly agree with you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bashkaya, if you don't mind, we have some question from audience. Of course. Okay. The first question, um, uh, a participation asked that, what do you do when uh, sigmoid sinus is damaged during surgery? So if this uh, it depends on the what stage of the surgery, uh, if, if you, if it hap this injury happened at early stage of drilling, nothing you can do, you just pack with the small gel foam or uh, uh, not too small gel foams and the pedis and then extend your exposure proximal and distal to the where you have injury. And then you, if you can, you have to repair primarily. If not, put a patch or something and then the nice pressure on it. Uh, if, if it happened when you are dissecting and you're already exposed, you just try to, try to repair it with the uh, uh, sutures. And I think best suture is 6O or 7O proline or nylon you can use. I, 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 it happened to me, uh, so I repaired it. And uh, same with the transfer sinus. And if it is, if it is unrepairable uh, and nothing you can do, you need to know before surgery is that sigmoid sinus is dominant or not. If it is dominant sinus, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, so, what, uh, what I suggest, best thing works for the dominant sinus injury, stopping there. You have to put ventriculostomy or something to measure the cranial pressures, lowering the blood pressure, and, and put sometimes pentobarb coma to few days to reduce the metabolic demand and then get over that area. If it is not non-dominant sinus, very likely nothing will happen. And what I do for uh, before surgery, I learned from Taka Fukushima, 
in sometimes I go trans sigmoid too. Uh, Dr. Professor Pamir said very well. Sigmoid sinus is the main obst obstacle in your way, but whichever approach you do, pre sigmoid or posterior sigmoid, always obstacle. So sometimes if it is non dominant, very small atretic uh, hypoplastic sinus you can take and you can do trans sigmoid sinus, trans sigmoid approach. Sometimes you don't, you are not sure. You can put a temporary clips on the sigmoid sinus. Wait. There is no brain swelling, nothing. You close. Wait 24 hours. Do imaging. No changes. Nothing in the imaging. Patient is doing fine. That means patient is going to tolerate that sinus ligation and transsigmoid approach. So you can do that too. Uh, so this is an elective conditions though. For urgent cases, repair, stop the bleeding first. And in extreme cases, you cannot do anything. Dominant sinus, do your best to get, get the patient over that period. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, another question. Uh, after cutting the eight cranial nerve, does he uh, do, do, does you take it away with a tumor or does not, uh, does you uh, stitch the nerve endings to each other after taking the tumor out sir oh uh, the first of all uh, i i don't know who asked this question but uh, i am take i am cutting the eighth nerve because patient has no hearing yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i don't need to repair again so Translab approach, I want to reiterate one more time. Translab approach is the approach you do when patient has no hearing or you decide to sacrifice hearing. And that's why you are cutting the eighth nerve. And you are cut, cut and the, for the acoustic neuromas, you are cutting vestibular nerves too because they're the origin of the superior or inferior vestibular nerve, they're origin of the tumor. Yeah. So su suturing back, Meaningless. I mean, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was so educational, uh, Professor Bashkaya. I'm sure the listeners uh, think like me. Uh, thank you very much again, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Baran. Thank you, Khan. Uh, Professor Pamir, uh, thank you very much for hosting me. And I see Hussein and Nejmetin, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, their lectures. I need just five, 10 minutes break then I'll, I'll i'll be back of course sir yeah thank, thank you. you very much thank, thank you sir. thanks everybody